I'd like to say good morning to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I certainly hope that you do, I'd ask you to open up to the Gospel of John. <laughs> no, I'm not <in> Matthew. <laughs> I was already in the wrong book. <laughs> yeah. Y'all can blame Daniel for that one. Bad joke. <clears throat> Matthew chapter, <coughs> excuse me, 15. This morning we're going to look at the heart of the problem. We've come as far as chapter 15, verse 9, where we stopped last time. And last time we looked at Matthew explaining to us as he writes, as he's inspired to write his gospel account, the difference between the faith of the people of Gennesaret versus the tradition of the elders, especially their man-made traditions. We saw that Jesus healed all the people of the surrounding district of Gennesaret, and then he's questioned by Pharisees and some Pharisees and scribes about his disciples not keeping the hand-washing tradition of the elders which they had made equal to or possibly even superior to God's Word. Jesus then proceeds to teach them how they are, what they're doing is sin, and He particularly focuses in <coughs> on their tradition of Corban, which they had actually elevated to be above God's Word. And Jesus says by doing that, they invalidated God's Word. He quotes Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 and calls what they're doing exactly what it is, being hypocrites. He says they honor God without sincerity, they worship in vain, and teach the precepts or rules of men as divine doctrine. And all the while they do this, they portray themselves as being holy, when in reality they're just hypocrites. And all of this leads up to our passage this morning where Jesus is going to explain the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. It's the hearts of the Pharisees and the scribes that led them to invalidate God's Word for their traditions. Jesus later will see calls them the blind leading the blind. You see, Satan has blinded them to divine truth by influencing them to focus on their heart's desires instead of what God's Word says. <coughs> <coughs> Satan still uses this trick today. How many times have you heard somebody say, what well, feels right in my heart, or just follow what your heart says, or how does it feel to you? If it feels right, it's okay. All these are the same tricks Satan used here. He still uses. You see, what Satan and his demons do is they take what's already in our hearts before we know Jesus, which is from our sin nature, and they blind us to the consequences of invalidating God's Word. To the consequences of following our hearts and not what God's Word says, to the consequences of elevating traditions above God's Word. It's what He did with the Pharisees. It's what He still does today. And as He influenced the Pharisees and the scribes to do this, through their hearts, it's very clear their hearts were not right with God. So this morning I simply ask you this. <clears throat> Are you defiled by what's in your heart? Or is your heart right with God? If you would please bow your heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for allowing us to be here this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for this privilege you give us, Lord. To come together corporately, to fellowship together, to worship you to hear Your Word preached, Lord. We thank You for all of this, Lord. We thank You, Lord, for the songs of Zion we're able to sing as we worship You, Lord. 
Lord, we do love you and we thank you, Lord. We ask you, Lord God, right now, <clears throat> open up the hearts of each and every person in the pews, Lord, here in the pulpit, those watching, those listening. Lord, we pray, Lord God, help us, Lord. Help each one of us, Lord, to, to ask this question of ourselves. What is in our hearts, Lord? Reveal to us what's in our hearts today, Lord. And if it be anything, Lord, then love for you and your word, help us to see that, Lord. And help us to make that right before we leave today, Lord. Lord, we do love you and we thank you, Lord. We ask you to be with each and every name added to the prayer list this morning. So many names added this morning, Lord. So many already on there and been on there for a long time. We know you keep track of all of them. Yes. We know you are the great physician. We know you can provide the healing. We know you can provide the comfort. And most of all, we know you are actively seeking and leading people to you today, Lord, drawing them to you. And we ask that you do that, Lord. Burden the people's hearts that do not know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be their day they get saved. Lord, we do love you and thank you for all you do for us and for what we're about to receive from your hand. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <coughs> so we're going to see truth revealed in verses 10 and 11 this morning. Matthew chapter 15. Verse 10, And after, Je after Jesus called the crowd to Him, He said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. He's just talked to the Pharisees and the scribes. He's just pointed out their hypocrisy that Isaiah prophesied about. <coughs> he mentions again, how through their man-made tradition, they invalidated the Word of God. Now he's going to address the crowd and explain the heart of the problem. And how it's a problem with their hearts. <clears throat> Notice here in verse 10. He says to the crowd, hear and understand. Hear in the Greek is akuo. And understand, soon iami. Both of these words are present, active, imperative, plural verbs. And you may be thinking, what does any of that mean? It simply means this. He's commanding them to actively listen and comprehend what he's about to say. What he says in verse 11. And he does this because this is vital information for our souls. For their souls. In verse 11, he comes back around to that question the Pharisees had asked him. When they asked him in verse 2 of chapter 15, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He circled it back around. <clears throat> what the Pharisees are talking about is ceremonial defilement. Now, specifically, they are talking about the tradition of the elders. It's not even a tradition from God. But they're talking about ceremonial defilement under the law or the old covenant. This is not what Jesus is talking about in verse 11. He's talking about defilement that goes way beyond ceremonial defilement. Jesus is talking about moral defilement. <clears throat> ceremonial defilement in God's word under the law would be something such as eating something that's forbidden under the old covenant and it could be dealt with through ceremonial means moral defilement could not and so Jesus is just doing, uh, excuse me, distinguishing between these two different types of defilement now as Christians, we are under the new covenant. We're no longer required to keep ceremonial law. That's why we do not have to keep the Sabbath. We do not have to make animal sacrifices or honor the dietary commandments. I remind you this morning, Jesus is our Sabbath. And through His sinless life and His sacrificial substitutionary death on the cross which He died once and for all. 
He did what animal sacrifices could never do. He paid our sin debt in full. You see, animal sacrifices merely covered up sin. But what Jesus did washes it away. Jesus teaches us that moral defilement is what comes out of the mouth from the heart. And when we get to verse 19, <clears throat> He's going to give us some specific examples. See again, moral defilement. What He lists in verse 19, this is not ceremonial defilement. This is defilement of our very soul. Moral defilement can only be truly dealt with when we repent of our sins, place our faith in Jesus alone, and make Him our Lord and Savior. And by doing so through faith, we allow His shed blood to wash us clean. When we put our faith in Him, we receive His Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead who will then indwell us. And it's through this, His indwelling us, that He will guide us and give us a new nature and change our hearts. See, Jesus says, <coughs> He'll later say, it comes down to the heart. But God changes our hearts. What He's sharing in verse 11 is pure divine truth. And that's why He has commanded the crowd and all of us throughout history that have read this to listen and comprehend it. Don't let it pass by you. Don't let it go over your head. Really get a grasp on this. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. He's saying, Get a hold of this and hang on to it and understand it. So I ask you this morning, do you understand the significance and the importance of what he's saying here in verse 11? Do you have a hold of it? Do you have a good grasp on it? I certainly hope so. Now let's see what the response of the Pharisees is to this divine truth. <coughs> Verse 12. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? Is anybody shocked that they were offended by this? <laughs> You've been paying attention, probably not. Does anybody think Jesus was unaware that they were <coughs> offended by this? No, he's aware. He's aware of it. Uh, one of the main commentaries I look at is from David Guzik, and, and he talks about in verse 12 how hilarious this scene must be as they come and tell Jesus, are you aware you offended these guys? He specifically said, of course he's aware. He intended to offend them because they're wrong. What they've been doing is wrong. I say this, he's trying to open their eyes and reveal spiritual yes. truth to them just as much as he's talking to the crowd. He's hoping these Pharisees and these scribes will respond. We talked about it last time. We said, when we stopped in verse 9, all they had to do was realize that everything he had just said was true and stop doing what they've been doing and just start following him and do what he said. They had that opportunity. He still wants to give them that opportunity. He knows that they have placed their man-made traditions above God's Word. He quoted Isaiah. They're teaching the precepts of men as if it's divine doctrine. And he's just confronted them about this. And Jesus knows even better than any of us that when there is a confrontation between truth and false truth, those holding to false truth are going to be offended. Because they don't want to admit that it's false truth. You may have experienced that in your life. Someone has a 
holding on to false doctrine and you talk to them about it, you confront them about it, they get offended. How dare you say that that's wrong? That's what I believe. It doesn't matter what they believe. It matters what God's Word teaches. God's Word is truth. When we stand on the Word of God and we share truth, we're going to offend people that hold on to false truth. You can just mark it down as guaranteed it's going to happen. Are we to stop? No. We continue to do so, not just with the idea or, or the, the motivation to offend. We do so out of love. We do so hoping and praying they will leave their false truth and grab on and hold on to and cling to God's Word, which is the only truth there is. There is no other truth. You want truth? Open this book. We must also remember there can never, I want you to get this, listen to this, there can never be any compromise to what God's Word says. It has not changed. It will not change because God has not changed and God will not change. No matter how much the liberals want to ignore parts of the Bible, no matter how much this world wants to say, but God's okay with this sin now. God's okay with that sin. That is a lie straight from the pits of hell. Do not believe it. God's word has not, will not, cannot change. We cannot compromise. When you make one compromise, you give the devil a foothold. And from there, you've lost. Unless... God works in your life and brings you back to Him, you've lost. You give Him a foothold, it's hard to come back from that. We've got to be aware of that. No compromises. People may say, well, that sounds real hardcore. It is hardcore. We're in a battle. We're in a spiritual war. We battle every day. This is not casual. This is not getting paid to play a game like football or something. This is war. It is hardcore. No compromises. Verses 13 and 14. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. He knows they, they are offended. These plants that he talks about, every plant which my Heavenly Father did not plant, he's talking about these leaders and their commandments, the, their traditions of men. And what he's saying is very simple. They will not last because they are not planted by God the Father. And I tell you, this applies to any false preacher or teacher today, and there are plenty of them out there. And there are many of them that are very good at fooling people. They will not last. They will be uprooted. There are many this morning standing in the pulpit just like I am, completely The people that they're in front of are completely blinded to who they really are. <clears throat> you want to know if someone is a false teacher or false preacher? Number one, what do they say about God's Word? What do they say about the Bible? Do they recognize it as the inerrant and inspired Word of God or not? There's your first test to give them. Do they say the Bible contains the Word of God or that the Bible is the Word of God? Because that is a big difference, church. The Bible does not contain the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. Amen. All the way through from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. 
Then you will know by what they teach and preach about Jesus. What do they say about Jesus? And I tell people as they talk about trying to find a church to go to. What do they say about Jesus? Do they teach the divine truth that He is the Messiah and the Son of God? Or do they teach or preach anything that opposes that? You go into a church and you hear the name Jesus and they're saying anything other than He is the Messiah and the Son of God, get up and walk out and don't look back. That's what I've told people. What do they say about God's Word? What do they say about Jesus? All that is false will be uprooted. That's his point here in verse 12. Now in verse 13, Excuse me, verse 14. Let them alone. Let them alone. Do you understand what those three words mean? Those three words, Jesus says, is a divine judgment and a form of God's wrath. Let them alone. Let them have what they want. Let them have their tradition. Let them cling to their man-made traditions, their hyper-legalism. Let them remain blind if that's what they want. We saw a little bit of that in Sunday school lesson this morning. They wanted a king. They wanted a king and God said, let them have a king. I told Samuel, let them have a king. Let them have what they want. This is the same idea Paul later writes about in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. If they refuse to hear and understand, they're going to remain blind. And what does Jesus say? And if a blind man guides a blind man, all those who follow after them, all those who follow after holding their traditions above God's Word, all those who follow after their hyper-legalism, they're just as blind as the guides, and he says, a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. I can't speak for any of you, but I sure don't want to be in a pit. Do not follow the blind. Make sure that the leaders you follow understand and believe and teach and preach God's Word. You don't need anything from me. You need God's Word. Anything I have to share with you doesn't compare to what God's Word says. After having addressed the offended state of the Pharisees, so he's revealed this divine truth Jesus has. <coughs> he's addressed the Pharisees and their offended state that the disciples have brought to his attention. He already knew about it, but they brought it to his attention anyway. Now... Here comes Peter. Peter's going to ask Jesus to explain this parable of defilement to them. He wants it explained to them. This is our last point this morning. Verses 15 to 20. We'll look at 15 and 16. Truth explained. Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. Jesus said, Are you still lacking in understanding also? Peter asks, maybe he's asking on behalf of all of them, maybe it's just for him. But he wants more clarification. He wants to understand this. Jesus says, are you still lacking in understanding also? Jesus is essentially saying, Peter, are you still blind? Now, to understand why this seems difficult, we must understand they're still under the Old Covenant. They keep the ceremonial law, such as the dietary restrictions. And Jews, in this day, and those that are Orthodox Jews today, believe in corporate salvation. That simply means they believe they are saved simply because they were born Jews. Because God chose them. And they believe they keep their faith in God. They show their faith in God through keeping the law. Peter's no different. Ceremonial law, especially the idea that all foods are going to be clean to eat, 
This is something Peter's going to struggle with even after we see him in Acts chapter 10, verse 14. It's not something he's going to easily transition away from. You see, it's not so much that Peter and possibly the other disciples, if he's speaking on behalf of the group, it's not so much that he doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. It's more likely he's having a hard time accepting what Jesus is saying. This transition to the new covenant. Like the Pharisees and scribes, Jesus' disciples are still thinking about ceremonial defilement. Not moral defilement. It's not difficult to understand Jesus' words, but Peter's struggling with why he said them. And he's struggling with accepting them as truth. Verse 17. Do you, this is Jesus still. Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? Making it very clear. I'm not talking about ceremonial defilement. It's not about what goes into the body. It's not about what's eaten. He says it very clear. Very basic un, uh, illustra or explanation of the process. It goes into the mouth. goes into the stomach. The body uses what it needs. And it gets rid of the rest that it doesn't need. It gets rid of the waste. That's how he designed these bodies to work. Goes into the stomach, goes out to the bowels, and gets rid of what we don't need, the waste. And his point is very clear. Food doesn't defile a person. He's not talking about what they take into the body. It's not ceremonial defilement. Verses 18 and 19. But the things that proceed out of the mouth, Jesus says, come from the heart, and those defile the man. The heart. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. It's not about external going into internal. It's about internal coming out externally. You see, the problem is, the, or let me say, the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. What comes out of our heart and through our mouths and through our actions? The heart, not the brain, the heart, Jesus says, is the source of evil thought. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. This is why sin is so prevalent in our society today. I mentioned it just a little bit ago. How many times has, have you heard somebody say, follow, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. You can't go wrong by following your heart. Look at that list Jesus gives. You definitely can go wrong by following your heart. Amen. You can't go wrong by following God. People commit all kinds of sins. And they blame it on following their heart. Oh, but people can't help who they love. You can help on whether you act on it or not. We're just as good as being married. It's okay. We love each other. We've got these feelings in our heart. God understands. No. Yeah, God understands you're disobeying His Word. He understands exactly what you're doing. The heart will lead you astray. This whole idea of getting your heart's desire. How many times does that work out for people that don't know Jesus? Zero. Look at that list again. Evil thoughts. Not here. Here. In the heart. Murders. Murder starts here. Works its way to here. And then, sad to say, many people choose to act on it. It goes from here and out, and they commit it. 
fornications, thefts, false witnesses, the list goes on. This is what is in each and every person's heart before they come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This was in your heart. This was in my heart before we come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. This comes from our sin nature. That's why Jesus not only gives us a new nature, but He gives us a new heart. We have to have it. Anybody that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has this in their hearts. They may be the best old boy you've ever met in your life. They don't know Christ as Lord and Savior. That's in their heart. Some are better at keeping it in their hearts than others. Some let it just come right out. But it's there. Not because I say it's there. Jesus says it's there. Again, it doesn't make any difference what I say. We're all born with that sin nature. Those who remain unsaved, they continue to have heart problems. Not physical heart problems, spiritual heart problems. So look at just a, two or three examples. <clears throat> Cain. Go all the way back to Cain. Cain had a spiritual heart problem. Cain was jealous of Abel and that God accepted Abel's sacrifice. His offering, I should say. He didn't accept Cain's. Cain didn't listen to what God said. Abel did. But his jealousy from the heart, what did it lead to? It led to murder. It led to murder. He killed his own brother. Here's one I know you all know. David, the man of God. For a moment, David had a heart problem. David lusted in his heart after Bathsheba. And he allowed that to turn into adultery. And that led to murder. David would just as guilty of murder as if he killed her husband on his own. He orchestrated the whole thing. David had a heart problem. David repents though. <coughs> Go and look through the whole history we have of Israel in the Bible. It's all heart problems. It's all heart problems. We see fornication, we see lying, we see adultery, we see all these things. Idolatry, all these are heart problems. The United States in 2023 has a heart problem. Amen. As a society, we have stopped condemning many of these sins on this list Jesus talks about here. Adultery is seen as just no big deal. It doesn't matter. The heart wants what it wants. You love who you love. doesn't matter if you've made a commitment to somebody else as a spouse. Not only have we stopped condemning many of them, our society has even went so far as to celebrate many of them. You can't even turn the TV on without it being crammed down your throat. See, we have... It's as if our society has said, you know why God's Word is irrelevant. We don't have to go by that anymore. Or they say God's Word has changed. None of, the, none of that applies to us anymore. Yes, it does. When we as individuals and as a society compromise with these defilements, we become morally defiled. Church, I say it again. We cannot compromise with what God's Word says. I don't care how much of our society stands against us. We stand on the Word of God. We must. Verse 20. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Pharisees are fuming now. They come back to their tradition. They want to hold higher than God's Word. But again, Jesus is saying very clearly, it's not what you put into the body. It's what you let out of the body that defiles you. It's about moral defilement, not ceremonial defilement. 
It's not about unwashed hands before you eat bread, done in a ceremonial manner. It's not about legalism or keeping the ceremonial law or man-made traditions. None of that can cure moral defilement. None of that's how we get salvation. Only by having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ can we be morally undefiled. Can we have that washed away from us? It's when He does this, He washes us clean. He gives us our new heart and our new nature and His Holy Spirit to indwell us. We can avoid and overcome these defilements of the heart. That's the only way. That is the only way. What's in your heart today? Are you concerned with ceremonial defilement? Or moral defilement? Or no defilement at all? Many seem to have no regard for moral defilement or any, any defilement at all. They just don't care. Jesus has plainly distinguished between the two. And how moral defilement is what defiles our souls. It's not about keeping laws or rituals. You can do that all day long and still be morally defiled. It's not about church attendance. It's not about being a church member. It's not about any of that. It's about recognizing that the only cure for moral defilement is to repent of your sins. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and let His blood wash you clean. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, or if you're watching or you're listening, you know you're defiled. God's made that clear to you through His Word. You know you're a sinner. You know that what Jesus says in verse 19, you know that's in your heart. The only question is, as the Holy Spirit draws you, will you say yes to Him? You may be thinking, what happens if I do say yes to the Holy Spirit? You'll get what God said He would give through Ezekiel. Chapter 36, verse 26, He says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Today, you can be cleansed. And today, if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, you can. I'll ask Sister Carla if she would at this time to come back. I'd like to do things just, just a little different this morning. If you would, please, at this time, stand. We're going to pray and then we're going to do it. <coughs> so if you would please stand and bow your head. Precious Heavenly Father, you've heard what you've given us, Lord. You know each and every person here. You know their hearts. You know what's in their hearts. I pray, Lord God that you reveal to each and every person in this building, each and every person watching or, or listening or that will watch and listen later, reveal to us, Lord, what is in our hearts. I pray, Lord, if there's any that do not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, they have heard your word, not anything I've said, but what you have said through your word. I pray, Lord God, that today will be the day they give yes, their lives amen. to you. Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will speak to them, draw them to you, Lord. Oh, I pray, Lord, just... Make them miserable in their sins, Lord, until they recognize they need you, Lord. They need to have your blood wash them clean, Lord. I pray, Lord, just help us all to see what's in our hearts, Lord. If there's anything in our hearts, Lord, that is hindering us from worshiping you, and working for you, and loving you, and doing what you've called us to do, help us remove it before we even leave this building today, Lord. Lord, we do love you and we thank you, Lord. We ask all this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Page 337. <clears throat> Reveal. 
revealed something in your heart that you need to get rid of, the altar's open. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the altar is open. Won't you come up? You already know Him as Lord and Savior, but you know that there's something in your heart you need to get rid of. You need to have it cleansed. That defilement is there. Come up and just spend a few minutes as the church sings and we worship our Lord. Just come up and ask Him to remove it from your heart. If you're here, you're watching live, or you're watching us later. Right where you are, as you hear God's word, not anything I've said. I have nothing special. I'm just an instrument God has chosen to use. As you've heard what God says, as the Holy Spirit is drawing you, say yes to Jesus. Ask Him to cleanse you of your father. You cannot even fully understand all that it means to be saved until you're saved. It's an experience that like anything else. We don't want anything in front of you. We want everything for you. So if you give, if today's the day you give your life to Jesus, we ask you, if you can, reach out to us and let us know. Let us help you in any way we can. Give you a Bible, invite you out if you're in the area. Come worship with us and learn God's Word. God to reveal to you what is in your own hearts. Yes. And then when God reveals to you what's in your hearts, I hope you'll do what's necessary, whatever it is. If it's something that doesn't need to be there, I hope you'll ask God to help you cleanse it out, wash it away, and get rid of it. If it's love for God, I hope then you ask God to just continue to strengthen that in you. I do thank you for your attentiveness to God's Word this morning. You are dismissed.